is part B of the healing process lecture. So moving on, we're going to be talking about um, how healing affects different tissue types. So first we need to define tensile strength. It's the amount of force a structure is able to withstand before failure occurs. Um, once the injury occurs, the normal tensile strength strength will seldom fully recover, so we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about timelines of returning athletes to sports or patients back to activities. Um, the strength of the surrounding tissue may contribute to an athlete's ability to return to sport competition without injury, which we need to keep in mind that we don't strengthen just the actual tissue that was injury, but injured, but also the surrounding tissues. Um, general tissue tensile strength according to phases of healing. Um, we have three phases of healing that we've discussed. The first one is inflammation or the inflammatory phase. And in general the tensile strength decreases about 50% um, in tissue the first um, 24 to 48 hours. This is when of course the tensile strength would be the lowest um, due to the injury. The second phase is the proliferation phase. Um, this is also a time of low tensile strength because our collagen type 3 um, is converting over to type 1 collagen. Um, and that collagen three, type 3 is really weak and so it takes a while um, for tensile strength to increase even when the type 1 has been um, starting to lay down. Then in the third phase, our remodeling phase, it's pro predominantly type 1 um, collagen for all the injured tissue and the strength is going to be the greatest, the inherent strength of the tissue. Now it's just developing um, strength of that tissue if it is contractile tissue um, or strength of the tissue surrounding that injured tissue. So we'll go um, kind of tissue by tissue and starting with ligaments. Um, it's a little bit different with ligaments, um, so there's different characteristics according to tissue type that make them um, different from each other. Um, we have a later and a longer process of collagen 3 changing to collagen 1 with ligaments. So we need to give ligaments a little more time to reach um, a higher tensile strength. It actually nears normal around 10 to 12 months. Um, so we're talking, this picture is of an ACL. So um, there was a trend for a while for ACLs to return to um, activities as early as four months post-injury. Um, and you can see that we will not have um, normal tensile strength anywhere close um, by four months. And they've actually had an increase in re-tears of um, ACLs that have returned that quickly. And so our timeline has actually moved back up to about six months um, for athletes to begin to return to activity. But keeping that in mind that it's going to be maybe a year before some of these um, ligaments have a normal strength. So they have to be really strong in surrounding tissue before they return to uh, activities. The effects of immobilization um, of a ligament. So um, in our example of our ACL, if we keep that knee immobilized where it can't move very much um, or at all, um, what takes place? Um, we have a decrease in the size and the density of ligament fibrils. Um, there's a disruption of the parallel arrangements of collagen. And there is a reduction in the load absorbing capability of ligament bone complex so where the ligament and bone meet. Um, that's the weakest junction. Uh, so it's important to get um, athletes moving safely. Um, so range of motion is really important um, when we're talking about post-ligament injuries. Otherwise we have some decreased um, effects of these immobilization which are listed here which you need to know. Moving on to tendons. So a tendon connects a muscle to a bone, has a really good blood supply. Um, therefore tendons will scar down to the structures around it and so we want to make sure that they don't get immobilized for too long. Um, however, tensile strength um, doesn't return to normal for about a year. So um, we have to balance this, um, how much we immobilize somebody with a tendon injury versus how much we move them. Um, it's often, um, it's fairly often that a tendon will be immobilized for 
three weeks if it's had a repair. For example, this rotator cuff here, um, if that was repaired, they would maybe have three weeks in um, a, an airplane splint so they couldn't move it, which is a fairly long time. So collagen begins to present itself in the first week, and by the second week it aligns um, with stress applied. Um, but that could be as little stress as just um, some passive range of motion, moving into some active range of motion, so it doesn't have to be a lot of stress. Um, revascularization can take place in the first three weeks, and then we can start to mobilize them by day 21, which I said about three weeks post-surgery. We're talking about um, muscle. Um, it's characteristic that it has satellite cells which replace small amounts of tissue with new muscle tissue. Um, so if we have small tears or micro tears in the muscle, which most people will get after a workout or strenuous lifting, um, that that can repair with muscle tissue. Um, however, if you have um, a larger tear, that will not repair with muscle tissue and it will have scar tissue. Contraction of a muscle um, can near normal um, in anywhere from six weeks to six months, and it depends on the muscle type um, and the fiber alignment as well as the location of the muscle. So um, muscle returned to 90% strength um, in six weeks when they did studies with rats and six months with cats. Um, so you can see muscle size is going to make um, a difference, and that's quite a range. Um, like I said, with small tears in the proliferation stage, we have myogenic cells, um, which will convert to myoblasts, and which convert to myotubes by day 13, um, and become muscle cells by day 18. But this is in um, really small tears, and larger tears are going to lay down scar tissue. The effects of immobilization for a muscle, we have loss of strength, about 40% loss after six weeks um, of elbow immobilization, which is fairly significant. If you immobilize the quadriceps or the knee, so the quadriceps don't contract, um, we have a 25% loss after four to six weeks. And um, just 72 hours after immobilization of the knee, you'll get a 17% um, strength loss. So actually very significant. Um, and, of course, it takes longer to get strength back than it does to lose it. Um, B is we have a decrease in muscle fiber size as early as 24 hours. The greatest atrophy um, from disuse occurs in the slow twitch fiber, fibers first, um, and over time um, they'll develop fast twitch characteristics. The slow twitch fibers will also decrease in number. Other effects of immobilization on muscle tissue, we have a decrease in size and number of the mitochondria, a decrease in the total muscle weight, an increase in the muscle contraction time, and there is selective muscle atrophy. Oftentimes if the knee is immobilized, we'll see greater atrophy of the quadriceps than we do the hamstrings, and if the elbow is immobilized, we'll see greater atrophy of the triceps um, over the biceps. Um, moving now to articular cartilage, um, there is some regeneration ability, uh, but scar tissue tends to form fairly fast. Um, the fibro cartilage regenerates better than articular cartilage, and um, typically type 2 collagen um, is there, but when it, it is injured, um, it will heal and scar down um, as a type 1 collagen. So. Um, the healing occurs with type 1 in about two months, although there's a lot of research going on now, um, and they're using um, different methods in order to try to regenerate articular cartilage. Um, so that can be changed a little bit um, on those healing times as they're seeing some for pretty good responses. Um, effects of immobilization. So if we, again, let's say we take the elbow, we immobilize the elbow, what happens to the articular cartilage in the elbow joint? We have a softening of it, um, the articular cartilage, a uh, decrease in the cartilage thickness. Uh, we'll have adherence of the fatty connective tissue to the cartilage surfaces. Um, pressure necrosis, which is where we have bone-to-bone -bone contact, so bone from the humerus, um, connecting with the ulna where that is in contact, um, will have cell death, so it's just from the pressure. So necrosis means death, so pressure death um, at the point of cartilage to cartilage contact. Um, this um, type of tissue 
um, the articular cartilage responds the slowest and least favorably to um, remobilization. Uh, moving on to bone, um, we're talking about osteoblasts or bone generating cells um, when we're talking about the healing process and um, here's an x-ray of a fracture um, of the uh, ulna and radius and um, so the osteoblasts are going to be working a lot here. <laughs> Obviously this is a fairly significant and displaced fracture which will take a while. Um, but the first thing to occur will be the development of a soft callus um, will form. These would be realigned, these bones, so that they'll line up better. And then we'd see a little soft callus start to form um, around the ends of the bones, and it develops into a hard callus. Um, by the third week, the bone ends are actually considered connected if we have a completely displaced fra or dis um, jointed fracture. Um, the, we have a stable site in about 40 days. Um, and then bone conversion, so it completely converts um, from the callus to the bone, um, can take three to four months. Um, bone has an 83% tensile strength at about 12 weeks. So well, three months and it's, it's looking pretty good. Effects of immobilization on a bone, well there's loss of bone hardness and then um, an increase in the brittleness of the bone. So um, it, physicians will often try to take um, the a route so that it might be, a, a joint might be immobilized, but we try to start doing some weight bearing. So um, you might have a cast on and you can start weight bearing um, a little bit earlier to prevent um, a decrease in the hardness of a bone. Um, in regards to um, healing time chart, um, just kind of an overview. Um, we talked about ligaments and tendons taking up to a year. Um, muscle can take up to six months. Um, bone a couple months, two to three months. Um, cartilage a couple months. Um, so um, it just helps you have an idea of how long it'll take for some tissues to get their tensile strength back. Um, what are the benefits of early passive range of motion then? Um, definitely we have some bad effects <laughs> of um, immobilization. Um, so what about um, early passive range of motion? There is no bad effects on ligament stability, so that's good. Um, we have a decrease in joint swelling and effusion. We'll have a decrease in pain medication usage. Uh, faster regaining of the range of motion and a reduced um, muscle atrophy. So all good things if we start early, early passive uh, range of motion. What are some factors that can influence um, the healing? Um, so we've given some general guidelines, but of course um, different things can affect this in either positive or negative ways. So treatment modalities, that might be heat or ice, um, used appropriately, of course they would help. Um, inappropriately they can delay healing. Um, certain medications can um, help maybe heal a site and, and some can slow down healing. Um, surgical or sterile techniques, um, age, um, different diseases, systemic diseases can affect healing of our tissues, wound size. Um, if an infection becomes involved, of course it takes longer. Uh, nutrition plays a big part in healing, uh, especially protein. So oftentimes people that will have significant um, injuries or post-surgical incisions will have to be on a high protein diet um, and muscle spasms um, can decrease the healing time. Um, treatment um, enhancement factors, we talked about these um, the first day of lecture, I'll just review them quickly. Um, to keep in mind, you don't have to write these down, but to keep in mind that when you're working with um, injured um, patients that um, make the program challenging but appropriate according to the healing phase, make it fun and interesting, use your imagination, and we've practiced writing some short and long-term goals. Um, and keep those in mind when we're work working with um, the patient. And what are we really trying to achieve? Um, we need to include home exercise programs. Um, and don't repeat them in the treatment sessions because they should be doing them at home. Um, we'll switch the exercises periodically 
increase the difficulty um, perhaps daily um, depending on the situation and of course good communication keeping them informed so just some general guidelines um, what about an overly um, aggressive therapeutic exercise program how do we know if we're becoming um, too aggressive um, and maybe the tissue can't handle the stress that we're placing on it so our first indication is when the um, athlete or patient comes back and they have increased pain um, you might have increased pain um, they might be a little sore after a, a treatment session, but if they come back the next day um, or two days later and they can't do the same things that you gave them to do um, because of pain, then you are too aggressive. Um, increased edema, so if it lasts more than one day post the exercise, it was too aggressive. And then diminished function, of course, they need to be able to do at least what you gave them to do um, the day before. So that concludes part B of the healing process. And um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks.